And good evening. We begin top story tonight with that deadly storm out west. Northern California inundated with dangerous flash floods as a second system threatens to do even more damage later this week. The powerful system drenching Sacramento County, causing a critical levee to breach. Look at these images here. Major highways, now just a sea of brown, dotted with cars submerged up to their roofs. Drivers stranded in the flash floods, climbing on top of their cars as first responders scramble to get to them. Dozens of people safely rescued by boat. At least one fatality reported with fears that number could grow as the water recedes. Some residents getting in their kayaks to cross impassable streets, others using surfboards and paddle boards. This same area now bracing for the possibility of another eight inches of rain later this week. And in the south, a separate system spawning possible tornadoes that we're watching tonight. This high school in Jesseville, Arkansas, damaged by a reported twister. 22 million people under severe weather alerts at this hour, and that is why right there, more tornadoes are possible as we head into the night. Bill Karen's here to walk us through it all in moments, but we begin first in California, where NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer leads us off tonight. The daring and dramatic rescues unfolded all weekend across California and continued today. A devastating deluge triggering a flurry of emergency calls as the suddenly stranded were plucked from submerged cars, flooded roads, and homes that took on water. This woman who tried to cross a swamp street this morning thanking rescue teams who likely saved her life. If it wasn't for you guys, We'll be in a lot of trouble and don't do nothing stupid like I did. After days of relentless rain, Northern California was pummeled with the brunt of a powerful atmospheric river, a band of moisture pouring onto the coast. In San Francisco, where the city nearly broke its single day rainfall record, pedestrians floated down busy streets. Others used kayaks or surfboards. Statewide, as roads remain impassable, some are still under evacuation orders. It was like Mother Nature came alive and declared war on Sacramento. In Sacramento County, where there's been at least one death, authorities are bracing for more. I've worked for the Kasumnas Fire Department or previously the Elk Grove Fire Department for 21 years. This is the most significant flooding I've seen in this area in those 21 years. With two more atmospheric rivers expected to hammer the region later this week, mudslides, rock slides and flooding are a major concern, especially with the ground already saturated. Tom? A critical situation there in California. For more on the forecast, NBC meteorologist Bill Karens joins Top Story right now. Bill, the West is not the only region getting hammered. We're going to get back to that in a moment. But let's start right now with what you're watching. And that looks like a lot of activity right there. Yeah, your eyes should be focusing on Louisiana. With this area in here, you can see the lightning strikes, the little white. Like This line of storms has a tremendous amount of rain with it, a ton of lightning. And over the last 45 minutes, we've had a confirmed tornado that's been on the ground. It's been rain wrapped and it's nighttime now. So you can't see it. Storm chasers can't chase it. We just know by radar that it's there and confirmation of some of the damage that's been done. And that was just west of Monroe, Louisiana. Went through a small town called Jonesboro, not Jonesboro, Arkansas, Jonesboro, Louisiana, population roughly about four to 5,000. And we have other tornado warnings, one to the west of Little Rock. We now have two tornado warnings in eastern portions of Oklahoma. So all of this region is at risk through the the evening of two things. One is going to be extreme flash flooding and the other is going to be the tornado threat. So flash flooding, remember those same areas we were just talking about, that line of storm with all the lightning? So not only did they just have a likely tornado go through, but now they're under a flash flood warning. So for first responders trying to get to that area to see the, who needs help, you know, you're going to have roads with water on them washed out. Very dangerous situation for residents and first responders there in northern Louisiana. And I'm concerned from Little Rock to Paducah, right before New Year's, you got hit by a tremendous amount of rain. The ground is saturated. All of this heavy rain is going to be over you through the night tonight, so we could have additional problems with flash flooding there. So here's the big picture. 24 million people are in the severe weather risk tonight. This will continue overnight, then regenerate tomorrow. So from New Orleans to areas of Alabama, south of Birmingham, including Montgomery, Tom, we're going to have another tornado outbreak likely tomorrow. Louisiana has seen a lot of tornado action over the last three weeks. I know we'll be monitoring this situation throughout the broadcast. I do want to get back to California there. The, the ground is so wet, and you were just telling me two more big storms on the way? It looks like Wednesday, Thursday is the main one. Then there'll be one as we head towards next weekend. But we already have winter storm watches up. Mammoth Mountain had 54 inches of snow in just the last two days. 
And now there's another huge events coming in and they're going to see a ton of snow. So here's the timing on it. So here's as we go through Tuesday. This is all kind of weak. But then as we fast forward and we go into Wednesday, and Thursday, you can see this plume of moisture just rolling in on shore. One of the forecasters in the San Francisco area was saying this looks like potentially the set of one of the worst events he's seen in the area. They're talking about roads being washed out, sides of mountains collapsing because of all the water and all the heavy rainfall. And on top of all that, some of the mountainous areas are going to pick up feet of snow, Tom. I think we could see some areas picking up up to eight feet additionally to what they already have. All right, we'll be talking about California all week. Okay, Bill, we thank you for that. Now to just release text from inside the Trump White House. They offer an inside look into the White House during the January 6th insurrection. The text released by the January 6th committee show top Trump aide Hope Hicks texting Ivanka Trump's chief of staff, Julie Radford, quote, all of us that didn't have jobs lined up will be perpetually unemployed. I'm so mad and upset. We all look like domestic terrorists now. To that, Julie responded, oh, yes, I've been crying for an hour. The message is revealing how some in the West Wing fume behind the scenes while appearing loyal to the president. I want to bring in NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hilliard. Vaughn, Hope Hicks is very loyal to the Trump family. We've known her since 2016 when we covered that campaign. At first, we were just reading a portion of these texts, and there's still more to go. Right, and all of this is happening at the backdrop that the January 6th uh, committee up on Capitol Hill will be disbanded tomorrow. The Republican-led U.S. House of Representatives takes over tomorrow, meaning Liz Cheney, that entire crew that conducted this investigation, these public hearings, will no, be no longer. That is where you're seeing these raw materials, these text messages. This is not testimony. These are text messages from January 6th. And you see Hope Hicks texting with Ivanka Trump's chief of staff, uh, referencing not only her potential employment and how they are all doomed, but even Julie Radford, that chief of staff, saying, that that very day on January 6th, she received a message from Visa about a job opportunity. In her words, she was blown off. Then there is another text exchange in which it's referencing Carly Kloss, who, of course, is the entrepreneur and model, but also the sister of Jared Kushner's sister-in-law uh, yeah. sister uh, uh, of the brother. Yeah. And in that message, uh, she writes uh, in a tweet during that January 6th attack, quote, accepting the results of a legitimate Democratic election is patriotic, refusing to do so and inciting violence is anti-American in which you see Ivanka Trump's chief of staff write to Hope Hicks saying, unreal, she just called me about it, referring to Ivanka Trump, to which Hope Hicks were set, referred and said, I am so done. Does she get how royally expletive they all are now? In real time, Trump's top aides realizing what this moment meant to the Trump family and its future. So we know the January 6th committee has finished their work. They referred criminal charges to DOJ. What happens next? This is the question here as to when the DOJ, if it were to try to issue an indictment of Donald Trump related to either the January 6th and efforts to overturn the 2020 election or the documents case uh, pertaining to the Mar-a-Lago documents that he brought from the White House. There is a, a time uh, element to this year. Of course, Donald Trump is running for president again, and we're just a year away from when there may be the Iowa caucus that we're talking about here. And so that is where time is of the essence. But this could come any day, weeks. It could be potentially months, though, when the Department of yeah, Justice... Yeah, and you wonder how the DOJ, you so. mentioned the campaign, if they want to interfere in that or what happens there. Okay, Vaughn Hilliard for us, Vaughn. We thank you for that. Turning now to Idaho, tonight's new details emerging about the suspect arrested in Pennsylvania for the murders of four Idaho college students. Now the alleged killer is preparing to appear in court for an extradition hearing. NBC's Gotti Schwartz spoke with the father of one of those victims who told him about the prospect of facing the accused killer in court. Tonight, 28-year-old Brian Koberger sits in a Pennsylvania jail hours away from an extradition hearing that could send him back to Idaho, where police say he killed four college students. Family members of the victims, Madison Mogan, Zana Kernodal, Ethan Chapin, and Kaylee Gonzalez, now bracing for the moment they may come face-to-face -face with the prime suspect in court. Tonight, we spoke with Kaylee's father, Steve. Do you want to see this suspect with your own eyes? Yes, definitely. I want this guy to get whoever this person that was responsible for this, I want him to be sick of seeing us and sick of knowing that these people won't let it go. Steve Gonzalez says the family had never heard of Koberger until the arrest and says he's relieved to see the progress in the case, but that he's waiting to see all the evidence police have. I feel a sense that we're on the right track to where I can say I can let my guard down a little bit, but we definitely still have a lot of work to do. And tonight, we're learning more about the suspect. Austin Morrison says Koberger was a teaching assistant in a criminal justice class he took at Washington State. Just rather quiet, very off to the side, standoffish. He sat in the class, didn't do a whole lot. 
Koberger's public defender saying his client was shocked by his arrest and will not fight extradition to Idaho. He believes he will be exonerated. He says Koberger traveled by car from Washington to Pennsylvania with his father, who said his son was acting normally. Police seizing a white Hyundai Elantra at Koberger's parents' home in Pennsylvania, the same model they say was seen near the crime scene around the time of the attack. Two law enforcement sources familiar with the investigation tell NBC News that DNA evidence played a role in leading investigators to the suspect. Meanwhile, Steve Gonzalez is still reeling from the loss of his 21-year-old daughter. Our next mission is really to find justice and, and make sure that uh, we have a closing chapter that meets the expectations of all the families. All right, Gotti Schwartz joins us now live from Moscow, Idaho tonight, right in front of that crime scene there. So, Gotti, I want to get back to your interview there uh, with the father of one of those victims. But I first have to ask you about that breaking news we had uh, moments ago. We know the public defender spoke earlier tonight, I should say, uh, and, and he gave some new information about the suspect and what's going to happen in the days ahead. Yeah, Tom, this is kind of odd. First of all, he said that he went to go visit his client in jail, and his client was engaged in outdoor recreation at the jail. Uh, he says that tomorrow there's going to be this extradition hearing. He's expecting it to last about 15 minutes, and then he expects uh, his client to be extradited back to Idaho, uh, possibly tomorrow night. So it's unclear when he's going to be in front of a judge here in Idaho, but something very important happens when he comes back to Idaho. Authorities tell us that under Idaho law right now, uh, they haven't been able to reveal very much in terms of what's in the probable cause statement, what gave them probable cause to make this arrest. Once he comes back to Idaho and appears in front of a judge, they will be able to unseal that probable cause statement. And inside, for the first time, we're going to see some of the evidence that was seized, that was used against him, potentially DNA. Yeah, we back could potentially you. get that information as early as Tuesday night, <clears throat> Wednesday, uh, at the latest. You know, you spoke with the father of Kaylee Gonzalez there and we heard a portion of it what more did he have to say as the families await this extradition well, they're awaiting this extradition, and they're also just preparing themselves for what comes next. You, you might remember this was a family that was terrified that the killer was going to come to one of the memorials or, or, or a public gathering and kind of relish in the pain that they caused. Well, this family said that they had been through the first chapter, which was pain and uncertainty. They say that they still fear that the killer is going to relish in the attention that this case has brought, but right now they are focused on making sure there are no mistakes mistakes made. They want to make sure everything is locked airtight, and they want to help police make any connections they, they possibly can uh, to uh, whatever this killer may have done here in Idaho before leaving. And they also say that they are presuming that everybody is innocent until proven guilty, innocent until the evidence uh, proves them guilty. And so they are very much looking forward to seeing some of the evidence themselves. Tom? All right, Gotti Schwartz with a lot of new reporting for us there. Gotti, we do appreciate it. For more on the suspect in the Idaho murder case and what is next, I want to bring in retired FBI Assistant Director Frank Figluzzi. Frank, thanks so much for joining Top Story tonight. There's so much I want to ask you. First, though, the suspect, we know he studied criminology extensively, right? He was still even taking classes after he had committed these, these uh, alleged murders. What type of advantage, if any, do you think this gave him up until now and possibly heading to the trial? There's no question someone at an advanced level, and he was certainly uh, beyond the master's degree at this point, would know better than the average person how to cover their tracks, how law enforcement would respond and necessarily look at a crime scene. So he could have staged things to make it more difficult um, for law enforcement to find him. But they have found him, and now we're going to see uh, whether or not that that background in criminology actually factored into what he did. When the chief of police and, and the prosecutor there in that county uh, explained what was going on right after they made the arrest, they, they were very clear and they were very, you know, forthcoming on, on what the public can expect in the media from the affidavit once he's extradited. But I know they're going to be very careful because they don't want to mess up anything in this case. We heard Gotti talking to the family about that. What do you think the public and, and will learn from that probable cause statement? We may learn a whole lot tomorrow. Now, remember, law enforcement does not need to put everything they have. They don't need to show all their cards in a probable cause statement for an arrest affidavit or for a search warrant. But they need to put enough to convince a judge or magistrate to make it happen. So we're going to learn tomorrow what beyond DNA 
um, evidence they had, how the, the white Hyundai car played into this. And then we, I'm fascinated by the rapidly advancing field of genetic uh, genealogy, which uh, apparently was used here. So we, we want to learn whether, in fact, it was the suspect's DNA or a uh, that was at the scene. And then they found, through public source information, a relative's DNA. And then how did they narrow that down to this particular suspect? Was he spotted? Was he seen on cameras in the neighborhood, in the city? Some of that could come out as early as tomorrow. Frank, do you think that's why it took seven weeks? Do you think, do you think part of that process was getting through the DNA information? We know it's not like the movies. It's not like Law & Order. It doesn't happen within a day or two. Do you think this was taking time to, to track him down through DNA? Or do you think it was DNA plus locating the, the, the white Hyundai Elantra? I think it was the totality of the circumstances here. I think we started off with a small, relatively small police department, not well versed in homicide investigations. Then we saw layered on top of that the state police and then the FBI. And then, yes, the laboratory results for DNA, they take time, not, not so much to establish that there's DNA at the scene, but rather this new process of genetic genealogy where you've got to go to the public source databases and see if anybody's even close to matching this DNA. And then, even when you do that, you've got to figure out, well, why are they close? Is it an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, a grandparent? And, and then you've got to, that's not enough. You've got to show that it's your guy. And that's where the surveillance, the protracted FBI surveillance across the country, then days at his home. And imagine the tense scenario where, you, where the agents are told, hey, don't lose this guy. He could hurt somebody else, but don't let him see you. That is a tense scenario when you're dealing with a killer. Frank, give me three things that have stood out to you. And I know we don't have everything yet, but three things that have stood out to you about this suspect so far. Well, I, I am fascinated by the fact that his academic background is in criminology and whether we're going to see evidence put forth that this was part of his own bizarre research project that triggered something in his mind. We're going to see a fierce battle in court over that, by the way, because is it prejudicial to a jury to say, look at this young man's research projects, and therefore he must be guilty because his research projects are about committing crimes and a mindset of a criminal. That's going to be an interesting court battle. N num number two, the DNA alone doesn't solve this case. So we, I'm eager to see what the defense says about, hey, yeah, just because he lives 10 miles in a 10-mile radius and he's a fellow student and hangs out in that town, albeit at a different university, um, doesn't mean that he wasn't in the house or had contact with them. And by the way, even if he did, prove that he's the killer and not somebody else that night. So um, lo lots to, to factor in here. And then finally, I, I, my own bias as a former FBI agent, I'd like to know what the FBI contributed here profile-wise, DNA-wise. All right, Frank Figluzzi, fascinating conversation. We thank you so much for joining the show tonight. We also have new details on a potential terror attack in Manhattan that happened on New Year's Eve. You may have heard about this, a 19-year-old now facing multiple charges after striking police officers with a machete near Times Square iconic ball drop. Authorities saying the suspect was already on their radar because his own family member contacted them. Kathy Park has the latest. Tonight, the suspect in the New Year's Eve machete attack in Times Square facing attempted murder and assault charges as federal and local authorities investigate the violent crime as a possible act of terror. It happened just hours before the countdown near a crowded checkpoint where New York City police officers were standing guard for the celebrations. Authorities say 19-year-old Trevor Bickford allegedly used this large knife, striking two officers in the head before he was shot in the shoulder. They shot right in front of us. Yeah, it was crazy. It was madness. Exclusive surveillance video obtained by NBC New York show revelers running into a bustling Italian restaurant as gunshots ring out. Because people were like crying, people were like screaming. This time, I, I was in action, so I had to do what I have to do. To get the people in a safe place and do my part as a New York. Three officers have been released from the hospital, including Paul Casalino, a recent police academy grad on his first assignment. It just goes to show you if it's not the first day or it could be your last day, the actions that police officers must take every day uh, are life-threatening 
uh, situations. Law enforcement officials tell NBC News Bickford doesn't have a criminal history but was already on their radar after a relative contacted them weeks ago, claiming he was expressing pro-jihadist views, which officials say he shared again this weekend at the hospital. Investigators also got a hold of his backpack, which they say held a pocket knife, $200 in cash, and terrorist propaganda. In his diary, authorities say Bickford wrote about where he wanted to be buried, suggesting he was prepared to die in the attack. Authorities tell us that Bickford traveled to the New York City area on Thursday via Amtrak and that he acted alone. Tom? All right, Kathy Park for us. Now to the deadly attack in one of Mexico's most dangerous prisons. 17 people killed over the weekend after armored vehicles ambushed the prison located just miles from El Paso. Authorities now saying at least 25 inmates are on the loose, including one leader of a notorious cartel. Morgan Chesky has this story. Clouds of smoke billowing from a prison in Juarez, Mexico, as police hunt for at least 25 inmates who escaped. Presentamos el listado y las fichas de los 25 personas que se fugaron del centro penitenciario número 3. The violent attack leaving 10 guards and 7 inmates dead. Que adentro que mataron muchos custodios. Pero necesito saber qué me digan de mi nieto. Relatives of inmates flocking to the prison demanding information. Pues queremos una solución, por lo menos que nos den un pormenor de cómo se encuentran ellos adentro. According to officials, early Sunday, several armored vehicles run by the Sinaloa cartel arrived at the jail and gunmen opened fire on the guards, just over eight miles from the El Paso border. Un vehículo que aquí ven ustedes en la fotografía, un vehículo Hummer H2, color blanco, que este, eh, hace la agresión ahí a, a, a la policía. The gunfire sparking a riot and chaos that lasted nearly three hours until Mexican soldiers and state police were able to regain control of the jail. But the violence didn't stop there. What is Mayor Cruz Perez Cuellar said later police had a shootout with other suspects in connection to the prison break several miles away. Murieron algunos delincuentes, tres delincuentes, hay cinco detenidos. Pero la información detallada se las haremos eh, llegar. Among those that escaped, members of notorious cartels. Entre los que se escaparon se encuentran Ernesto Alfredo Piñón. Este es el líder de este grupo criminal conocido como El Neto. Including one leader known as El Neto, serving 224 years in prison for multiple kidnappings and murders. The prison is infamous as one of the most dangerous in Mexico, the same place Pope Francis visited in 2016, calling for an end to the, quote, cycle of violence and crime. But the violence has not ended. The state attorney's office said its staff is now investigating the incident. Okay, Morgan Chesky joins us now live from Dallas, Texas. It's incredible, Morgan, right? It sounds like the jail officials there were outgunned by the cartels. And you mentioned this in your piece, but this is a prison notorious for violence and housing rival cartel members. This wasn't the first time we've seen chaos starting at this prison spilling out into the city as well. Yeah, Tom, unfortunately, that is absolutely correct. In fact, there was another riot as recently as this past August that left 11 people dead. In that instance, authorities say two inmates were killed on the inside of the prison, which led to alleged gang members on the outside shooting up the city of Juarez. Nine others were killed, Tom, including four members of a local radio station who were holding an event at a nearby restaurant. Tom? Okay, Morgan Chesky with an update there from near the border. Morgan, we appreciate it. Now to the war in Ukraine. The Ukrainian army delivering a major blow to Russia with a strike that has killed dozens of Russian soldiers. Although military leaders in Ukraine say the number of fatalities are in the hundreds, Russia's saying something much different. Matt Bradley's in Kyiv with how Russia's fighting back. Tonight, Ukraine's single deadliest attack against Russia in months. Using American-supplied HIMARS rockets to level this vocational college, that Russia had been using as a barracks for newly recruited troops in the east. Russia's Ministry of Defense saying 63 Russian soldiers died. Earlier today, Ukraine's military said as many as 400 newly recruited Russian soldiers were killed. Still, Russia is firing back, far from the front lines. Kyiv's mayor said air defenses shot down 39 Russian drones that swarmed the capital overnight. At night, I heard a very strong bump, said this man. The furniture even moved. The attacks mostly targeted the power grid, leaving many Ukrainians without heat and electricity in the bitter cold. 
Russia has launched these attacks since the fall, usually around once a week. But now, they're daily. This was the fifth straight day of bombardments. Do you think that the Russians could run out of missiles, run out of drones? On the drones, it depends on how many Iran would be able to supply to Russia and how strong Western sanctions would be in reducing that supply. On missiles, now Russians are using their untouched spares. He credits anti-air weapons provided by the US and Europe for swatting down most of the missiles and drones, helping keep the lights on on the home front as this war stretches into the new year. And tonight, Ukraine's President Zelensky warned Ukrainians that Russia is planning another prolonged attack with those Iranian-made drones. Tom? Matt Bradley for us. For many Americans, the holiday travel season is ending the way it began with flight delays and cancellations. Tom Costello tonight on the battle to get home. On this big post-New Year's travel day, mounting delays and cancellations yet again. Fog in Denver and gridlock in Florida after an air traffic control computer failure cut traffic to a trickle. Stuck on the runway in Palm Beach, NBC News producer Jason Calabretta. Stuck on the tarmac for almost two hours. The pilot says it's a problem with the entire state of Florida. We're still unsure when we might take off. Today's delays come after Southwest Airlines' multi-day meltdown stranded hundreds of thousands last week. Flying to Portugal on vacation, the Mulaney family's Southwest flight from Little Rock to New York was canceled, forcing them to spend $3,000 to buy tickets on American, fly to Philly, stay in a hotel, then rent a car to JFK to fly to Lisbon, where Tom Mulaney, who flies 100 times a year on business, says he's already switching to other carriers. I spent a lot of time on Southwest Airlines, and the issue becomes now that I don't know that I can trust them. Southwest has promised to reimburse families like the Mulaney's for all related travel expenses, conceding the airline scheduling system is antiquated. CEO Bob Jordan emailed employees this weekend. We have plans to invest in tools and technology and processes, but there will be immediate work to understand what happened. The president of the Pilots Union told us today there is no time to waste. They're going to have to do it quickly. Um, and we're going to have to see some real answers and a real, you know, uh, map as to what's going to occur over the next week, over the next month, and, and really over the next three to four months, because it really can't be delayed longer than that. Now, we just checked, and the FAA says it has now resolved the Florida air traffic control issues. We still do have lingering delays, up to three hours at Palm Beach. The other trouble spots tonight are Orlando, Fort Lauderdale, Dallas, Denver, and San Francisco. Tom? Okay, Tom Costello for us. Tom, we appreciate that. When we come back, the chase taking police to new heights. Take a look at this one. The moment officers found a robbery suspect, you can see him there, look closely, about 30 feet off the ground in a tree. How they managed to track him through the woods. Stay with us. All right, we're back now with Top Stories News Feed, starting with the wild arrest of a robbery suspect in Massachusetts. New video from a police infrared camera showing the suspect. You have to look closely. You can see him there about 30 feet off the ground after he climbed into a tree to hide from police officers. Now, the cops say the 24-year-old led police on a chase after an alleged robbery at a shoe store in Worcester, a tracking dog eventually helping officers find him and take him into custody. A national park off the coast of Florida has been temporarily closed after hundreds of migrants landed there over the holiday weekend. Authorities say multiple boats, and look at the kind of boats they were, carrying 300 migrants in total, arrived at Dry Tortugas National Park. It's about 70 miles west of Key West. A majority of the migrants are believed to be from Cuba. They will be transported to Key West and evaluated by Border Patrol. Ferry and seaplane services to the island are also temporarily suspended. And also in Florida, officials are investigating yet another ride failure at Orlando's Icon Park. Video shows sparks flying from the side of a Ferris wheel. You see them right there. This all happened after the Ferris wheel lost power. More than 60 people were trapped on the 400-foot tall ride for three hours before they were rescued. Luckily, no one was hurt and no word yet on the cause. You may remember the name Icon Park. It was the scene of that tragic accident last March when a 14-year-old fell to his death due to an ill-fitted hardness on a free fall ride. Okay, we do want to turn overseas now with the outpouring of grief and remembrance after the death of former Pope Benedict. Today at the Vatican, tens of thousands lining up at St. Peter's Basilica where the body of the Pope Emeritus lay in state ahead of Thursday's funeral. Molly Hunter reports from the Vatican. 
night, the body of Pope Benedict XVI lying in state in St. Peter's Basilica. An estimated 69,000 people filed through today to say their final goodbyes. Over the weekend, Pope Francis paid tribute to his predecessor, calling him so noble, so kind. The two men held wildly different worldviews and visions of the church. Born Joseph Ratzinger in 1927, he was the first German pope in more than a thousand years. A theologian, a strict conservative who put hot button political issues at the center of his papacy, opposing same sex marriage and women priests. Critics accuse him of not doing enough in the church's sex abuse scandal. But today, those waiting in line remembered him personally. He remains a fundamental person for my life and. Uh, it's uh, important for me to be here in Rome. It is like when a father dies, his sons go to him. Filippo Toso took an overnight train from Venice to Rome this morning to be one of the first. How was it? Amazing. It was not important to see, but to be and uh, to be here. Mountain Patoric, an American Catholic living and working in Rome, had the rare chance to visit Pope Benedict lying in rest at his monastery home on Sunday. I've been bringing people to Rome for 20 years. It was the highlight of all my time in Rome. History will remember Benedict as a traditionalist who bucks centuries of tradition, retiring in 2013. A radical precedent that will define the future of the Vatican. All right, Molly Hunter joins Top Story tonight from the Vatican. And Molly, people may remember the funeral for Pope John Paul II. The whole world was watching that. But this type of funeral for a retired pope is unprecedented in modern times. So what will we see over the next couple of days? Yeah, Tom, 2005, those were extraordinary scenes. And this is going to be very, very different. Now, according to the Vatican Press Office, though, we did see huge numbers of people this first day to go pay their final respects to visit the former pope, the late Pope Benedict XVI, who was lying in state in St. Peter's Basilica, 65,000. And that's just on the first day. So he will be lying in state Tuesday and Wednesday. The funeral then, Tom, will take place on Thursday right here in St. Peter's Square. And the current pope, Pope Francis, will preside over the funeral mass Thursday morning. That is the first time that has happened in more than 600 years, Tom. In your report that we just saw there, Pope Benedict had a complicated legacy. I think that's fair. What's been on the minds of the Catholic faithful that have gone there, have traveled to the Vatican to pay their respects? Yeah, hugely fair uh, and controversial, complex. All of that uh, is hugely top of mind. What was interesting, though, Tom, we got to the front of the line uh, first thing this morning to meet the people who woke up early because they wanted to be first in line to get inside. And actually, what was so interesting, we heard so many personal stories, so many people who had actually met Pope Benedict in their lives, who had uh, taken communion from him, who had really personal stories. And so it was the personal, it was the gentle, it was the calm man that we heard about. Actually, one man who took a train from Venice to Rome over night just so he could be first in line said this is what sons do when their fathers die tom okay molly we appreciate that while catholics all around the world mourn the loss of pope emeritus benedict many are reflecting on his legacy and the future of the church without him christopher Bolito, he's a professor of history at king university and he's an expert on the vatican he joins top story tonight christopher thanks so much for joining the broadcast we were just talking while we were watching molly's report you're saying something's happening right now that people haven't seen in 600 years and it's something they can actually visually see with their eyes correct so it's the first time that a sitting pope is presiding over the funeral of his predecessor. Usually we don't have a new pope until the prior pope is buried. But since Benedict retired, we have this. That's correct. And the big thing that you could see as Benedict is laid out in a wake, that's essentially what you're seeing, an elaborate wake, is that he's not wearing around his neck a white garment, a white circle of cloth with black crosses on it. That's the symbol of a sitting bishop's authority. He is no longer the bishop of Rome. He's retired, so he's not wearing that. And so what do you think we're going to see on Thursday as far as the pomp and circumstance and the traditions of the Catholic Church? Well, it's going to be a funeral in the same way that Catholics have funerals every day to uh, mourn the death of a loved one. 
And yet it will be, they'll sing every verse of everything. It will be longer. It will be more elaborate. But the real thing that's surprising that historians like me are looking at is the fact that you have the current pope, Francis, who's going to be presiding. Whether he'll be actually celebrating the mass, whether he'll physically be able to do that, we have yet to see. Certainly he will be preaching. But uh, I think he's also going to be thinking, the sitting pope, Francis, is going to be thinking about losing a friend. What a great thing it was to have somebody nearby that he could ask. You've been through this, he could say to Benedict. How do we do this? Yeah, that's one way to look at it. Uh, some people would, would look at it a different way. And, and we sort of saw that dynamic in that great film, The Two Popes, that Anthony right. Hopkins played right. Benedict. It didn't happen. But, but yeah, 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 obviously. But um, pe people got a sense that, that there, was, there was some drama there. Because as you mentioned, you had a retired pope and you had the sitting pope. And Benedict wasn't necessarily quiet. He, he didn't sort of go away and, and just retire and pray. He sometimes came into the public eye. Right, and that's the lesson that we have to draw coming forward, is probably papal resignations will no longer be rare. The last one was 600 years ago. Yep. Francis has said Benedict's move, now Benedict, a very traditional conservative man, is legitimating this very surprising activity. So Francis has said the resignation in the post-papacy will now be an institution. And he's already indicated, just as Paul VI, John Paul II, Benedict, had written letters that said, in the event I become incapacitated, then therefore I resign. So what will that look like? We got a minute, and I want to do ask you about that. What, yeah. what do you think is going to happen? We, we know that the current pope, Pope Francis, is 86 years old. He has had trouble with his health before. Right. He was traveling a lot before. Obviously, the pandemic has changed things a bit. What do you think happens with, with Pope Francis? I think that Francis will resign um, at a time when he thinks he can no longer do the job. But I think he will retire in a different way. He's already said that he would take the title Bishop of Rome Emeritus. It's likely he wouldn't wear white because that was confusing. It's likely he wouldn't use his papal name because that was confusing. And he'll stop writing and giving interviews. Christopher Belito, professor uh, at Kane University, we thank you so much for joining Top Story. Thank you for having me. Okay, we turn now to Top Story's Global Watch in the desperate effort to save a 10-year-old boy trapped in a concrete pile in Vietnam. The boy falling into a narrow shaft in the concrete at a construction site Saturday. Rescue crews lowering a camera into the 115-foot shaft to look for him. They say they haven't seen or heard from him today and don't know how he fell into the shaft, which is only 10 inches across. And terrifying video shows the moment a tiger shark came dangerously close to a swimmer off the coast of Australia. Take a look. The shark captured in this drone footage coming within feet of a woman before abruptly turning around. It happened at a popular beach in Perth. The person filming says he ran down to the shore once he spotted the shark in the video. All swimmers were quickly evacuated from the water. and Luckily, no one was hurt. And thousands gathered in Brazil to pay their respects to the late soccer legend Pele. Video shows mourners lining up to pass his coffin, which was placed, you can see there, in the middle of the field at a stadium outside of Sao Paulo. The stadium near his hometown is where he spent most of his career and scored some of his most iconic goals. His body will remain there for 24 hours before his funeral tomorrow. Pele died at the age of 82 last Thursday after a cancer battle. Welcome back. We got a wild one for you. Video of a South Florida Pomeranian. It went viral after the dog's owner brought it to a Miami Heat game with a painted coat that made it look just like, that's right, the Pokemon character Pikachu. He got into some trouble, but now he's speaking out and trying to prove his point. WTVJ's Alina Machado has more. The South Florida Pomeranian went viral after showing up courtside at a heat game Monday. It's, it made NBA history because nobody's ever seen a Pikachu dog uh, sitting next to an NBA player uh, before. But it's Pikachu's fur collar that is now making headlines. The dog had already gotten the attention of Miami-Dade Animal Services during an inspection at his owner's Doral Puppy Store on December 21st. Pikachu was in the store. Uh, there was a, a staff member holding the dog uh, on her lap and we obtained a photograph at that time. Kathleen Labrada, assistant director of Miami-Dade Animal Services, says there's a county ordinance saying it is unlawful for any person to possess, sell, or otherwise transfer within the county any dyed or artificially colored rabbit or other animal. So on December 28th, a few days after the initial inspection at World Famous Puppies, the county told Eric Torres, the dog's owner, they would be issuing a citation. No animal should be dyed, regardless of whether there's an ordinance prohibiting that or not. You don't really have any any guarantee or any assurance that the um, 
the chemicals they're putting onto your pet are safe. Miami-Dade Animal Services says they have issued 16 citations against world-famous puppies since they were licensed in March of last year, with many of those citations stemming from complaints alleging the sale of sick dogs. Eric says he does what he can to keep the dogs healthy and disputes the allegations. Puppies are very delicate. Uh, they do tend to have very low and weak immune systems as they develop. Uh, so it is the nature of the business that dogs do get sick. Pikachu, Eric says, is his family dog and is not for sale. Here it is. It's a dye. You can eat it. He tells us he bought a bottle of the dye and maintains it is safe enough for him to eat. He plans to appeal the citation. Because at the end of the day, I had no idea that this ordinance even existed. He also says he is staying outside of Miami-Dade County for now. You're not allowed to have possession of it, so it's been kind of freaking me out. <sighs> Can't believe he actually tasted that dye. We want to thank our Elena Machado from our South Florida station, WTVJ, for that report. And we thank you for watching Top Story. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.